going on guys? Today we're going to look at two new enclosures that I've built. These are both paludarium style enclosures. You can see I've got a new background behind me. This is going to be my new background for my videos from now on. Um, and these are also the two new enclosures that I've built. One of which was for my green tree python. The other one was for my green tree frogs. And my magnificent green tree frogs, which will soon be going in this one with the green trees once they get a bit more size on them. Both these enclosures are made by Exoterra. Their dimensions are three foot long, 45 centimeters wide, and three foot tall. So because these enclosures have decent height to them, I've made them into paludariums, which are essentially an aquatic bottom with live plants on top. So with the exception of the enclosures, pretty much everything else in these enclosures, I made myself. Uh, the rock ledges I made by hand, and even the branches and vines are kind of DIY branches. They're not ones I found outside. They're completely homemade. Reason I wanted to use artificial vines instead of naturalistic, real branches in these is because both these enclosures are rainforest enclosures because one's housing a green tree python, the other is housing frogs, which both like high humidity. There's lots of moisture in this enclosure and this enclosure will have a misting system installed on it very soon. So it's going to get wet regularly. Real branches in this sort of scenario can potentially start to go moldy or rot over time. So I just rather use fake ones. So if you guys like the look of these artificial vines, they're actually quite easy to make. You go to your local hardware store, like Bunnings Hardware, Mitre 10, they usually carry this. It's a type of garden hose called weeper hose. Now weeper hose has a very rough texture, honestly very similar to the um, Exoterra vines that you can buy, the kind of artificial vines that are bendable by Exoterra. Weeper hose has a very rough texture, very similar to that actually. So you essentially just buy some weeper hose and then you want to buy some wire. Now, the thicker the wire you get, the more sturdy these branches will be. So it varies depending on what's going to be using them. If you're going to have more heavier animals using these artificial vines, go for thicker wire. But you want to use wire so you have some uh, bendability to these vines. Because these vines, they're fully bendable. Um, so essentially you get your weeper hose, you thread the wire into the weeper hose. You can then cap it off at each end with a bit of silicon or something, just so the wire kind of doesn't poke out as easily. And that's pretty much it. You can even use, you can either use a single piece of weeper hose and kind of have a thinner branch like what I got here, or you can kind of twist them around each other, like licorice in a way, to achieve these kind of thicker, kind of twisty looking vines as well. Um, that does add a bit more strength doing that as well. And I've pretty much just silicon them into the tank. The fake rock ledges that I've also made in both these tanks, there's much more of them in the green tree frog tank because the green tree frogs actually like sitting on ledges. So I've given them multiple tiers and levels to kind of sit on where the green tree python isn't actually going to use ledges. He's going to primarily stay on the vines, uh, which is also why he's got different sized vines where the green tree frogs just have the thick vines because green tree frogs are pretty big fat frogs. So I just give them a big fat branch to support themselves where green tree pythons, uh, they're kind of picky about what branch they choose to sit on sometimes. So it's best to give them a few different options of branch thickness. So they've got thin and thick ones. Um, the, I've only got one ledge in the corner here opposed to this bottom ledge. And the only reason these ledges are even in there at all is so I have somewhere to put plants. Now to make these rocky ledges, you basically just get a piece of plywood or any scrap piece of wood, preferably something kind of thin because this is purely just a stencil really. Um, it's not anything that structural. And you pretty much just cut out the size of the ledge that you want and you cut out the shape of the ledge that you want from this piece of wood with a jigsaw. Bearing in mind, whatever shape you do decide to cut out with this wood, just um, keep in mind it's going to be bigger once you use your expanding foam on this wood. So go a bit smaller in terms of like width and length because once you're expanding foam this wood, it's gonna be a bit bigger. So as suggests, you then get some expanding foam and you do a layer of expanding foam over the top of that wood, wait for it to dry, usually overnight, flip it over, do the other side, wait another night for it to dry. So it, this is a bit of a process. It's, these two setups honestly took me about a week to like put together fully because of all the waiting for things to dry between jobs. Um, from there, once you've done your second expanding foam on the underside of the ledge, you can get a box cutter or a razor blade or a scalpel. I've found a box cutter to be easy. Um, and you just carve out the shape you want to make your ledge look more naturalistic. 
Now all these ledges I've cut to fit in one corner of the tank, depending on what corner I want. But each ledge has a singular kind of right angle to one corner at the least. So you don't have to do that, but having it kind of go into one corner is an extra point of contact with attaching it into the tank so it's got more strength. Rather than just the back of the ledge being attached to the back of the tank and that's the only support, it's good to have at least one corner piece so you have a, the back area which is glued to the back of the tank plus at least one kind of right angled corner glued to the side. Just a bit more strength, especially if these are large ledges or you're gonna have kind of heavy animals on them. So once these are all cut out to the shape you like, you then wanna get some black roof guttering silicon and you wanna do a layer of that kind of section it at a time because it does dry kind of fast. I usually do, depending on the size of the ledge, I might do a third to a quarter at a time. This was probably the most time consuming part for me. Um, you're essentially using your fingers to kind of smear the silicon over the ledge. And then once you do a little section before it dries, you get some fine sand. I was using fine brown sand and you kind of just sprinkle it or throw it onto the wet silicon. And again, you do like one side of your rocky ledge, let it dry, flip it over, and do the other side. This creates that kind of fake rock look, which I honestly think looks very similar to universal rocks, artificial rocks. Once it's dry, kind of just get off all the excess sand, just give it a good shake over a tub or something, or you can vacuum it even. From there, we're putting it in the tanks. So um, I like to also use that same black silicon to help glue them into the tanks because I've found expanding foam doesn't attach to glass as well. It still sticks to glass pretty okay, but that silicon just again adds a bit of extra strength. So I initially use expanding foam to put them into the tanks because expanding foam, hence the name, it expands. So it will fill in all the gaps because these tanks came with their own artificial 3D backgrounds. They're not a fully flat back on the tank. And this means that on the back part of the background, especially there's a lot of gaps because the background that's already in the tank is very uneven. So I used expanding foam to fill those gaps. Had to wait another night for that to dry. And you might notice I'm using kind of just random things around my house to support the shelves as I'm doing it. Um, but it seems to, it seemed to work okay. And anyway, so I expanded foam the back, waited overnight for the dry, same thing with the silicon again, and then the sand to give it that kind of color to blend it in. From there, once all that was dry, um, I'm pretty much good to go with that. So it was kind of a process because I had to do the lower shelves first, wait for them to dry enough to then put random objects on those lower shelves to support the next layer, layer of shelves that I was doing. So it, it took a few, a couple of days just to get all the shelves kind of well, all the ledges, I guess you'd say, installed properly. Um, just randomly stacking things up to support them as they dried. Next thing was to create places for me to put plants. Now, the beauty of these enclosures is I've made them so the plants are fully removable. Uh, if I put a plant in and down the track, I decide I don't want it in there anymore, it's overgrown or I don't like the look of it, or it's just not doing well in that setup for whatever reason, I can just remove it. So rather than having like a bioactive style enclosure where there's a massive bed of soil that the plants are growing in and they kind of root in and they're kind of semi-permanent or a bit of a pain to take out and kind of messy. Um, there's no big soil area in this. Um, two reasons I've done this. Firstly, like I was saying, I can remove plants quite easily if I want to. Secondly, I want to have minimal things in this enclosure that are capable of breaking down and decomposing because I want to minimize um, mold and things like that because these enclosures are high humidity and high moisture. Because regarding the green tree python especially, they're very prone to respiratory problems because they need high humidity. Um, you need to mist the enclosure regularly, but that combination, if you have lots of things in the enclosure that are gonna decompose, can lead to mold and various other spores in the air that can give them respiratory problems. Um, so you kinda wanna find that happy medium where they have high humidity, and good ventilation, but also minimal things that are gonna create mold. So I try not to have a big bioactive sort of scenario here. I'd rather just keep it looking as, keep it looking like a naturalistic bioactive setup without it actually being bioactive. So rather than a big soil bed, I've just kept the plants in their pots. So what I've done is I've pretty much cut out holes in the ledges that the plant pots fit into. And I kind of just, 
used wet sphagnum moss to kind of hide the rim of the pot so it all kind of blends in nicely. If I want to access the plant, I can just take the sphagnum moss off, take the pot out and swap it for something else if I ever need to. So to cut holes in the uh, ledges, um, you can use a Dremel. Um, I started using a Dremel and I found it actually wasn't that good. Um, pretty much because, I don't know, maybe the holes I'm doing were kind of bigger than a Dremel's capable of. Um, I actually found it easy to just use a knife, just use a box cutter and cut out chunks at a time. Um, that, and then just use your hands to kind of pull out the foam. Um, and, and that actually works quite well. Another thing I also did um, with the peace lilies in this tank, because I've got one peace lily here, and in the green tree tank, I've got another peace lily just there, the spathophyllums. Um, they can actually live with their roots fully submerged in water. They can actually convert their roots over to aquatic roots. So they'll actually work as like a hydroponic sort of a thing as well with their roots in the water. What I've done there, rather than leaving them in their pots and just making little plant pot holders, I've got a, I've gotten my hole saw. I've drilled a hole straight through the bottom shelf itself. So the roots are in the water. So I've taken the plant out of the pot, washed the soil off the roots, and just kind of stuffed it through that hole so the roots are poking down the bottom into the water. And I've just got a bit of aquarium sponge, the kind of coarse filter sponge, and cut it to size and kind of just wedged it in that hole with the plant just to keep it nice and tight so it stands up nice because it accidentally went one size too big with the hole I drilled. The plant will eventually grow and fill that hole in, but for now it was a bit floppy and loose because the hole was a bit big. So I just stuffed a bit of sponge in there for now, but it seems to be working quite well. I've also got pothos, which um, are just cuttings I took off a big pothos I have growing outside. And I've just got that in the water as well. So pothos can also grow aquatic roots and live with its roots fully submerged in water. And again, this will also act like a hydroponic sort of a, sort of a thing where the roots from the plant will pull nitrates out of the water which are from the organics of the animals living in the tank. So I actually did drill some holes in the bottom ledge also with just a drill bit and I just poked pothos through into the water. And then I just have the pothos, that's just a small cutting on the side there. I'm hoping it'll eventually grow up the side. I got some more pothos on this side going right up to that ledge. I have another small piece that I've tied onto this uh, vine here which is dipped into the water. So hopefully they will root up eventually and kind of grow hopefully along the background or along the ledges or something, but you know, pothos, super easy plant and it's great for hydroponics. So while we're on the topic of plants, uh, the plants that are in both these setups um, vary a bit. So I have obviously some spat phylums. I've got some golden pothos. I have a velvet butterfly. Um, this one up here is a tractor's seat. Um, this is a epiprenum, I forget which variety though, but it is a ground scrambling Epiprenum, so hopefully it will kind of scramble and spread along this ledge. Um, I have a dwarf umbrella tree. And lastly, this plant in the center here is an Alocasia lordobrachiana. Um, so they're kind of a very dark leafed Alocasia, so they do better in lower lighting. Um, so I don't know how it's gonna go in this tank, but I mean, in theory, all these plants should do pretty well. Um, there's decent lighting on this tank, it's high humidity, they're getting frequent watering, so it's kind of like a greenhouse sort of scenario, so theoretically these plants should do fine. Lastly, I had to install the vines. So again, I just used the black silicon and I used the fine sand to blend the silicon in. So these were a bit of a pain in the ass to um, put in the tank as well, because they're kind of like um, very, um, I don't know, they fall down easily and stuff, but actually it went relatively smoothly, like all things considered. Um, similar to the ledges, I initially was using just random objects to start at the bottom and work my way up with supporting them. So they were just sitting in the place I wanted them to sit, siliconing them, letting them dry. As for the ones that are higher up in the tank, I actually had to use string um, to help suspend them in the spot I wanted them to sit. Then I siliconed them and they're all good. As for the aquatic section of these paludariums, um, I pretty much just use fine white sand, which I um, took out of my aquarium, which I no longer have. So in this spot right here, I used to have an aquarium. I used to have quite a large aquarium, but uh, over the years, it's just not really been for me anymore. I've had this, I had this aquarium for almost a decade, and um, while I loved it and it was great and all that, um, 
I work in an aquarium. I deal with fish all day, every day. I spend every day cleaning aquariums. It's just not really something I like to do when I get home nowadays. So I feel like uh, generally the aquarium just wasn't for me anymore. And I kind of simultaneously wanted to upgrade some enclosures for my reptiles anyways. And I've been wanting to do these for a while. So I thought these would be a perfect enclosure to put in that aquarium's place. Um, now I got rid of most of the fish that were in that aquarium. I took them back to work at the shop. I did hang on to a few that I've just kind of become attached to because I've had them for over a decade and they're actually living with the green tree python in the bottom section of that enclosure. So the bottom of the green tree, so the bottom of the green tree python's enclosure is heated and it has filtration as well. I've got some bits of savory rock in there just so there's some sort of escape in there so it's not just fine white sand and it's completely open. I've mainly just hung on to my eel and a few of my catfish that I've had for, like I said, over a decade and I've just kind of gotten a little attached to them. Um, and they're kind of just chilling out in the bottom of that enclosure, which I feel like they kind of like because these catfish do like to hide a lot and keep out of the light, so does the eel. And because the green tree python enclosure has quite a large ledge on the bottom, right on the water line, um, and it does the full length of the tank. So the whole back half of the tank is pretty much dark and shattered, dark and shadowed. Um, so the catfish really like to hang out under there anyway, and they occasionally come out to the front, but they like the darker section of the enclosure for the most part. The green tree frog enclosure has nothing in the bottom section at the moment. It is filtered. So there is a filter running on that, of course, but I don't have any animals in the water yet. I'm not sure if I'm going to put anything in there. It is kind of barren though. Um, so I might just put some bits of driftwood or something in there eventually, just so it doesn't look so open and barren. Um, I might just put some maybe, I don't know, mountain cloud minnows in there or something, or maybe some um, Pacific blue eye rainbows, just some cold water species, something small in there. Or I might just leave it with just driftwood. Don't really know yet. Not too bothered if there is something in there or not. If there is, it's only gonna be something fairly small and easy to manage though. So that's pretty much how I made these two paludarium style enclosures. Like I was saying guys, one has a green tree python, the other has green tree frogs. Very similarly set up though. Now the green tree frog enclosure has five frogs in it and there will be three magnificent tree frogs going in there soon. They're just not big enough yet that I don't trust them with the green tree frogs. I worried that the green tree frogs might eat them. So I wanna wait till they grow a bit before I chuck them in. The main difference between the two is the green tree python enclosure is more regulated with humidity and temperature because green tree pythons are a bit more demanding about their parameters Green tree frogs, not so much. They're from New South Wales, which is where I live. Um, they can handle our summers, they can handle our winters. So this natural climate I have here is kind of what they live in anyhow. So I don't really need to do much for this enclosure in terms of like maintaining a specific level of humidity and temperature. For the most part, I can just leave it do its thing and I can put some heating on there during winter if I wanna keep the frogs more active, but generally I don't have to worry too much. The green tree python enclosure is more regulated He's got a ceramic heat emitter at the top left corner, which is on a thermostat, so that's his warm spot. And he does have a hydrometer hooked up on this enclosure, keeping an eye on the humidity levels. And like I was saying, I am planning on installing a misting system on both of these, which will help with um, raising and lowering humidity and just the general evaporation of the water at the bottom will help keep the humidity at a semi-regular level anyways. But I'll go into that on another video, guys. If you would like to see a care guide video on green tree pythons, let me know in the comments. I can be more thorough with it there. But until then, I'll see you in the next one. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. You can buy me a coffee if you'd like to support the channel. There's a link in the description for that. Until then, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.